Ok. Eh, so, so I intended these lectures as the, <laughs> this is the very basic self-contained description of the main techniques uh, uh, to treat uh, uh, nonlinear second order elliptic equations. So basically what I plan to do is to in the first lecture, describe uh, what are the main nonlinear equations, divergence and non-divergence, uh, and how do you get to need to prove uh, two very important theorems. One is uh, the Georgi uh, Nash Moser theorem, and the other is the Krilov Safanov Harnack inequality, and how they apply to one, how, how do you use them to sort of close the regularity theory in one case of divergence on linear equations and the other uh, non-divergence. Uh, so, okay, so let me start. So I think one of the most remarkable uh, things when I was a student many, many years ago uh, that, that most surprised me was the fact that if you have a holomorphic function, you know, just because it satisfies this silly relation between first derivatives became automatically an analytic function. Or in other words, if you take the real part of the holomorphic function, that is the harmonic function, right? Just because Laplacian of u is equal to zero, this <laughs> implies that instantaneously this function became uh, analytic. And not only became analytic, real analytic, but all the derivatives of the function were controlled by the function itself. So if you want to try to explain this, there are three, one can use three different methods, three different techniques. The first one is superposition. Right, if Laplacian is a linear equation, then by superposition you can prove the regularity, and this is, for instance, by superpositions, one can think of Fourier transform. Or potential theory. The second, uh, the second reason one can give is energy considerations. That is the fact that the Laplacian is the Euler-Lagrange equation of the Dirichlet integral. <laughs> I mean, I will go through this. It long. This is going to be very elementary. If some, you know, feel free to leave if you, <laughs> you know, you already think you know it. That is, but I want to do it self-contained and 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 starting from scratch. So it's the Euler-Lagrange equation of the Dirichlet integral. And the third is the maximum principle. Let me write it as the comparison principle. Right, that says that if you have, okay, if you think of the maximum principle, it says that the harmonic function cannot have a strict maximum or minimum in its interior. In its interior. If you want to think it as a comparison principle, it says that if you have two harmonic functions, then they cannot have an interior contact point. And the reason for that is that Laplacian is a monotone function on this square. That is the trace of this square of the Hessian. Is monotone on this square. And so at the contact point, since the d square of u2 is supposed to be bigger sort of uh, than the d squared of u1, then this is not possible. 
I mean, it takes a little bit of modification, the argument, but that's basic, the basic result. <coughs> I mean, I know that this is blatantly not true, but I mean, you should accept. But it's true, as you probably know, <laughs> with a little modification. Okay. Okay, so since, I, I, since I'm interested basically in nonlinear equations that are not, in some sense, a small perturbation of a linear equation, then but for me the most interesting approaches will be this one that corresponds to variational problems and this one that corresponds <laughs> to fully nonlinear equations. Okay. Okay, so let me start by saying a few words about the Laplacian and linear equations, which will be useful for me later. So, so what are the, the main properties I'm interested about uh, the Laplacian? As I said, if you have a harmonic function, so and let's say it's bounded in the unit ball of Rn. V1 will always be, if I don't put the point, it's always the origin for any ball Br. Then you can control all the derivatives of u at the origin. The constant that depends on the order of the derivative. Right. Uh, times the sup of u in the ball of radius 1. Or the oscillation of u. So this is basically, you prove with potential theory, you prove with Fourier transform, you can prove any way you want, okay? Uh, what I'm interested now is, so I want to make the difference between two types of results. One, which I would like to think of as small perturbations, and the other are those theorems that some sort of change the invariant structure of the equation. So there are two types of regularity, well, there are four types of regularity theory. So the first type of regularity theory, so the first two classifications I would like to make are, is the following. There are regularity theories which are inherit from the boundary and regularity theories which are interior. The boundary and the ones which are interior regularity. What do I mean by that? Okay, you, for instance, can say uh, if Laplacian of u is equal to zero and u restricted to the boundary of the unit ball has some regularity, C1 alpha, C2 alpha, whatever, this implies that u in the whole ball has the same regularity. Okay. So this is what I call a regularity result which is inherited from the boundary. It's just the fact that, for instance, if you take angular derivatives in Laplacian of U is invariant under rotations, right? 
If you take angular derivatives, they are harmonic again. If you take second angular derivatives, they are harmonic again, and so on. Okay, so these results are, you know, the advantage of these results is that usually require less of the operator inside. The disadvantage is that you need to know that the function is nice at the boundary. Okay. Opposite to it is the interior regularity result, which is, the, for instance, the one I stated here, right, that says, you doesn't have to be continuous at the boundary, anything. It's just any very weak control, could be the L infinity norm, could be the L2 norm of U. Any very weak control I have of U in the unit ball tells me that inside U is very nice. Okay. So this is a more interesting result when you are interested in local properties or solutions and so on. When you don't want to say or you don't know anything about the boundary behavior. Sometimes you have to combine both to obtain a reasonable theory. Okay. <coughs> and the other classification I like to make are that there are regularity results which are sort of a small perturbation of others. And there are sort of what one could think in intrinsic regularity results, regularity results that do not depend on previous ones, which are that signify sort of a change in invariance class. Uh, for instance, small perturbation results are the Schauder and Calderon Sigmund estimates. I mean, that doesn't make them easy. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but why do I mean by small perturbation? If you look at the proof of Schauder theorem, right, basically what it says is the following. It says, for the Laplacian, I know some regularity theory. If I write Laplacian of u equal f, right, then not only the Laplacian, not only this special combination of second derivatives, but each one of the second derivatives is in the same functional space as f, right? To f, then dij of u belongs. to the same functional space, space as f. For instance, f so is being held. We all know that there are critical exponents that fail, right? Like L1, L infinity, Lipschitz, and so on. But sort of philosophically, right, if f is in a C alpha space or in an LP space, right, then all second derivatives are in that space. Uh, uh, in the same space, right? And in fact, if you look at the proof, the proof is indeed, I say, it's a small perturbation because it's basically, they usually goes around, uh, I mean, so this is for the Laplacian. So this is not the small perturbation. So, so what is the small perturbation? The small perturbation, for instance, says that if you have an equation Aij of x, Dij of u equal to f, Right? An Aij is a smooth and elliptic. If this is in some functional space, if this is in a C alpha space, and this is a C alpha space, right? Then Dij is in the same space. <coughs> and why do I say it's a small perturbation? Because if you look at the proof, Right? The proof basically, the idea of the proof basically consists on freezing the AIJ at the point to make it the Laplacian, right? So you write this as Laplacian of U equal to <coughs> F plus whatever is left, uh, AI minus AIJ.
you make sure that AIJ by its change of coordinates, you make sure that AIJ at the origin is the Laplacian, so this vanishes. And then you do a fixed point argument. You said, okay, you know, let's suppose, <coughs> let's put here a V, right, which is in a C2 alpha class. Then this is in C alpha, but it's very tiny, right, because the oscillation, by the oscillation of AIJ is small, this is very tiny, right, and so you can say, that <coughs> the Laplacian, see, that U is controlled, the C2 alpha norm of U is controlled by, by, the, by this result, by the C alpha norm of F, plus a tiny multiple, the C2 alpha norm of B. So you look for a fixed point. You, if you look for a fixed point, then you can embed this into here, and you have the Schauder estimate. So the Schauder estimate, and there are many ways you can see that. I don't want to enter into the details of the proof. But, there are, but basically, the Schauder estimates are a small perturbation theorem. You know, once you know the regularity for the Laplacian, dependence in x is many times just a small perturbation theorem. And then there are the theorems that jump. So why is this a small perturbation theorem? You can think of this as a small perturbation theorem. If I give you an equation Aij of x, dij of u equal to 0, okay? I like to think of this as a small perturbation theorem because if A is continuous and you want to zoom on a point, right? In other words, if you start to make dilations of this equation, right? Then that's the same that is you are looking at Aij of epsilon x dij of u. If you make an epsilon dilation of the graph of u, then the Aij's you are zooming into a point, and so the Aij's basically become constant. Okay. So if you want to look sort of in a very tiny neighborhood of a point, the Aij become constant. So, so that's why this is a small perturbation theory. Because if, if AIJ has any regularity, when you rescale it to look at the origin, it becomes a constant coefficient operator. Okay. So what I want to, point to discuss in these lectures are the, those results that you need for nonlinear equations that really sort of change, sort of uh, change a scaling class. Okay, and these are the Helder continuity of solutions of equations with bounded measurable coefficients. So in other words, the two theorems I want to discuss, the two first theorems I want to discuss is when you have an equation U equal to zero, right? The Helder continuity of solutions when AIJ is just make no regularity assumption in AIJ. So this the theorem, as many of you may know, says that if Aij is uniformly elliptic, then U is C. And the same for non-divergence coefficients. Now, what, what is important about these theorems, what is important about these theorems is that if you take an equation that you don't assume any models of continuity and you rescale it and rescale it and rescale it, you always stay in the same class. There is no chance that you can write a regularity result from this just as a small perturbation of the Laplacian. You need to have a new 
different understanding of the equation. Another typical example is when you do boundary regularity. If you have a domain which is a smooth, which is C1 alpha or something like that, and you rescale it, it becomes a half space. So if you can give me an equation Aij of x dij of u equal to 0, uh, u equal f on boundary of omega, and if this is a smooth, and this is a smooth, I'm sorry, if this is a smooth, and the boundary of omega is a smooth, right? And you start rescaling the problem, you end up with the Laplacian in a half space, okay? And a constant right hand side. So there is a hope, and in fact it works, that you can study this problem as a small perturbation of a Laplacian in a half space, okay? And this is all the theory of C2 alpha boundary data or whatever, okay? But if boundary of omega is ellipsis domain, for instance, right? Even if you have the Laplacian ellipsis, okay. Then you have again jump the scaling class. You take ellipsis domain, no matter how much the natural rescaling is expanding all the variables the same, no matter how much you rescale it, you end up with ellipsis domain. Okay? And so the theory of harmonic functions in Lipschitz domains is a qualitative jump from the theory of harmonic functions in smooth domains. <coughs> okay. Okay, so let me... So I wanted to... Dis today I wanted to discuss for you a little bit How does the need, you know, one could say, well, why do you need such an equation? Why do you want to prove this? You know, whoever saw a bounded measurable coefficient, okay? So today I wanted to discuss, to just review how the need to look at such problem arises, okay? So he said you have Laplacian of U, right? And if you think of nonlinear equations which are related in some sense to to the Laplacian that look like the Laplacian in some sense, they come in two different ways. One is a divergence types equation, right? The divergence and the non-divergence. Okay. Divergence equations come uh, for two reasons. One is from continuum mechanics and the other is from uh, continuum or fluid dynamics, for instance. Dynamics, for instance, or calculus of variations. Okay. Uh, it comes from fluid dynamics because usually the laws from fluid dynamics, that they are conservation laws, are really additive set functions. Okay. So, conservation laws. are functions. Okay. A typical example is conservation of mass. Let me take the simplest example, conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid. <coughs> Conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid simply says <coughs> that if you have the velocity field of the fluid, right, and you give me any domain omega which is filled with the fluid, right, all the time, then at any instant of time the amount of, suppose you have a stationary flow, is not changing in time. Then the conservation of mass simply says that the amount of fluid that goes through, the ones that goes in minus the one that goes out, has to be constant. 
So really the law is not an infinitesimal law. Really the law is that if you take any domain D, right, then the integral along the boundary of D of V dot nu has to be zero. Okay. So this is a set this is a set function. I mean if you prescribe for instance compressibility or whatever, this is really a set function, right? So for any function you give this quantity, you try to prescribe this quantity, but it's an additive test set function. If I split it in four parts, then you know the set function that is this quantity for the union is the sum of the function. So if it is an additive set functions, then it, it has to reduce, in some sense, it's unavoidable that it has to reduce to an infinitesimal relation. Right? Okay. And the infinitesimal relation is that the divergence of the vector field has to be prescribed or zero or whatever, depending on the source. Okay. Uh, what I'm driving to this is that sort of the divergence types equation. So what is the typical divergence type equation, right? Elliptic equation. Divergence of a i j of x, the j of u equal to zero, let's say, the typical divergence equation is really an integral equation. It's not a differential equation. In the sense that if you take a i j which are differentiable, you can write the equation through and it's okay. But if, for instance, if I gave you a i j which are held or continuous, right, then there is no way you will ever be able to show me a solution or a subsolution or a super solution of a problem. Right? If I tell you is x squared is a solution of this problem, no, in general it is not. You know, this is the most convex, simplest function you can imagine. It is, you cannot say if this is a solution or a super solution of this equation. Not even linear functions are solutions. Right? Okay. So, so divergence equations are really integral equations. And we will see that the methods that we need to use are really integral methods. Okay? Why do you need to study these equations with AIJ that are just bounded and measurable, that where you are not willing to assume any continuity of it? So why should we look at AIJ of x with no regularity? There are two important areas. One is the old one, one is the most recent one. The most recent one has to do with homogenization. In homogenization, you want to look at AIJ of X, which are as nice as you want, right? But they are as nice as you want in a scale epsilon. So in other words, you can start with very nice AIJ, but you want to look at AIJ of X over epsilon. You know, this is when you have, for instance, a composite material and you look at it from very far away, or the composite material has very fine structure, right? Then the AIJs oscillate at scale epsilon, and they can be analytic. They could be, you know, cosine of x over epsilon, 2 plus cosine of x over epsilon, if you wish, right? But still you want to say things which are independent of epsilon, okay? And so the regularity of the AIJ, although AIJ is analytic, all the regularity estimates you can make will depend on epsilon, and you are interested in things which are independent of epsilon. Okay. So really you want to understand these equations without any hypothesis on the regularity of AIJ. The other comes from the calculus of variations. So in the calculus of variations, you, want, you are interested in functions u
that are local minimizers of some energy integral. For instance, a typical example would be you give me a curve in R3 uh, and you want to fill it with the graph of a function that minimizes area, right? The minimal surface. So you want to fill it with a file. So you give me a curve and you want to look at the area of all possible graphs that takes that boundary. So you want to minimize. among all admissible configurations, and all admissible configurations means those u's which are equal to f on the boundary. Okay, so if you want to do that, suppose you, for instance, suppose you create the right functional class where you are able to find a minimizer. Okay, so suppose that you find a minimizer of f of gradient u. So let u zero minimizer. As you know, you can deduce an equation for u by making a small perturbation. You have the graph of u, right? You are a small perturbation t times phi with phi as log is this zero infinity function, right? And so the energy, so this let's call u t, right? And then since u is a minimizer, the energy of ut has a minimum for t equal to zero. So you compute the derivative in t, right, and you get the standard. And you get the standard weak form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, gradient phi fj. <coughs> or integrating it by parts if you, but you see the, the equation really, the the way you get the Euler-Lagrange equation is in an integral form. If you insist on integrating by parts, right, you can say, okay, I get dj of fj of gradient u. Okay. So in general, what you get is a solution in a very weak functional space. For instance, in H1, gradient U, if F has quadratic growth, you ask gradient U to be in L2, right, to make sense of the functional. You minimize in the Hilbert space, 
right? And what you get is a function whose gradient is in L2 and that satisfies this in this sense, okay? And you would like to prove further regularity, okay? So you ask, can I prove further regularity? Prove further regularity. So there is a first golden rule that is very simple, but I heard from Serring many years ago, and it's very good. So the first golden rule is if you have an equation with a comparison principle and translation invariance, the derivatives have to satisfy something. Okay. So this is an equation which has a comparison principle, that is if you have two solutions, two minimizers, they cannot cross, right? Because if not, this will be a minimizer and this will be a minimizer. Okay, so it has a comparison principle, it's translation invariant, right? That means that the derivative satisfy, have to satisfy something. Why do you have to satisfy something? Because suppose you have u, and suppose that a minimizer u0, and suppose that you know that on the boundary of the, the minimizer is very nice. For instance, you are prescribing very nice boundary data, okay? Then, if you make a small translation, right, and you know that at the boundary, if I translate and I lift a little bit, if I know that at the boundary, I'll, I'll go to this argument in more detail later. If I know that at the boundary I translate and I stay above, then I have to stay above inside, okay? And says that, that says that the derivatives have some control. Because the incre these incremental quotients, right, when I make them tinier and tinier, become the derivative. So this is the reason behind the fact that translation invariance plus comparison says something about the derivatives. But I'll give an example more in detail of this example. So in any case, so, so if you believe this philosophy, what you want to do is you want to take derivatives of this equation. Okay. So let me first say, okay, the first thing you, there is a first step one can make is to say, Let's try to look at this as a second order equation, right? So let's try to pass this derivative through and see what happens, okay? So the first thing you want to do is pass the derivative through. So if you pass the derivative through, then what you get is the derivative of fj with respect to the i position, right? And this tells you the first thing, right? The first thing this tells you is that if you want the Euler-Lagrange equation of F to be elliptic, you want this matrix to be non-negative, okay? So this says that F must be convex. Okay? There is another way in which you can get to the same conclusion, right? which is the following. If you can ask, take two points, right? And then you want the minimizer to be the line, or you take the restriction of a plane, and you want planes to be a minimizer, right? So you don't want a little wiggly thing to have less energy than your plane, okay? If it happens, it happens, but then it won't enter into this theory, okay? If you ask, what do you need to ask from F? to avoid a wiggle to have less energy than the line, then this is convexity of F. Okay, so you can see the need of convexity this other way. Okay, so you look at this equation and you remember the elliptic theory and you say, if I know that gradient U is Helder continuous, right? then I am in business, because if I know that gradient U is Helder continuous, right, the Schauder estimates tell me that U, second derivatives of U are Helder continuous, right? Now, assuming that F is nice, right, implies that 
dij of u is c alpha, right? Implies that gradient u is c1 alpha. Implies that dij of u is c2 alpha, and so on. Okay. So if I know that gradient u is Helder continuous, I am done. So remembering this principle that the, that the equation being invariant under translations, the gradient has to have to satisfy something, you said, okay, let's take a derivative of this equation. Okay. So let's say I look at the direction alpha, right? I take a unit vector E alpha, and I take derivative in the direction alpha. Okay. So let E alpha be a unit vector. And so I take derivative in the direction alpha of this equation, and I get dj fij of gradient u di of, let me say, u alpha, the, the directional derivative of u in the direction alpha equal to 0. Okay. So first derivative satisfy this equation. Okay. And I would like to deduce from there that they are Helder continuous. Okay. And so people for, for many, many years for many, many years people try to solve this issue by forming some kind of a system. Because here is this gradient of u, and here are the derivatives of u. And so there is a temptation to say, well, this is an equation which if I look at these coefficients, I only know that these are bounded. If fij is quadratic, strictly quadratic, all I know is that this is a uniformly elliptic matrix. But I only know no continuity doesn't fit in any of the classes I know, right? It's a different scaling class. And so for many years, people tried to sort of make of this, you know, try to attack this problem by making some sort of systems where these coefficients and this unknown will be linked, okay? And I think this was one of the most extraordinary things of uh, the Georgi theorem is that the Georgi had the vision of saying, I don't care, right? Just the fact that this is an elliptic matrix should imply the regularity of U. So I think the merit of it, I mean, he did it to solve exactly this problem. You know, if you look at his original paper, is the title is on the, on the regularity and analyticity of minimizers in the calculus of variation. So he, it's not that he looked at AIJ, he was looking at this problem, right? But he has this vision of saying it is enough to satisfy these elliptic equations with AIJ bounded and measurable for u to be regular, for u alpha to be regular. And so this is the first theorem I wanted to prove. So it's the Georgi's theorem. In fact, I wanted to give the Georgi's proof because I think it has a lot of geometrical insight in it. I mean, it's a, it's a proof. You know, I, I like most of, everybody prefers Moser proof because it's very functional and analytic. You just plug u to the n and comes out, right? And everybody says that Moser proof is easier, which is not true because in the middle, Moser uses John and Nirenberg. You know, if you put together... For the Harnack inequality. Well, you can prove. Okay. Well. <laughs> In any case, I think my taste is that the George's proof is extremely more powerful geometrically. In other words, as soon as you get away from functional spaces, the George's proof is, is very powerful geometrically. So I want to prove the George's theorem. It says. You have a solution. I, I will, all my solutions will be very nice. I will freely take derivatives and whatever. I think it is the 
the structural issue what matters. So I have a solution di, AI j of x, dj of u to 0 will be 1. And uh, let's say u uh, in h1, then u is held that continues of b1 half. And the C alpha norm of U will be one half. This is more or equal than the constant the LT norm of U will be one. Okay. Okay, the proof is based on an interplay of two competing inequalities. The Sobolev inequality and the uh, energy inequality. Okay. Proof. Interplay. Inequality. Energy equality. For every truncation of U. Every truncation. Every scale. Scale of U. In other words, uses that any multiple and any dilation of a solution is a solution. So you can always. Uh, Look at every scale and rescale the same uh, the same inequality. And it's divided in two parts. And they are each one is especially the first one is a is a technology piece on its own, which is very important. Okay. The first part says that if U is an L2, if U has a small enough norm in L2, inside U is bounded. Small enough, U plus, small enough, then U plus, U one half, to one. Okay. And the second part is an oscillation theorem. So from L2, now we are bounded. And the second part is called the oscillation lemma. It says once you know that U is bounded, and you start to reduce dyadically your domain, the oscillation of U decreases geometrically. So lemma.
is that the oscillation of u in the ball of radius 1 fourth is a smaller or equal than lambda times the oscillation of u. The oscillation is the sup over minus the inf, right? u in the ball of radius 1 for some lambda. Lambda that depends only on the ellipticity of the equation. Less than one, yeah. As I said, so, so especially this first part, that is that the L2 bound implies the L infinity bound, okay, depends on the interplay between Sobolev inequality. So part one depends on the interplay. between Sobolev inequality, right, that says that gradient u in L2 controls u, and it's not Poincaré, it's Sobolev, in the sense that it is in a higher space, okay, And this is for any function true. And the energy inequality, I'll, next time I'll go through, I'll do Sobolev and the energy first, sorry, but. And the energy inequality, that is a particular of the solution, sub-solutions of this equation, that says that the energy is controlled by the L2 norm. So I still have seven minutes because I started late. So let me give you, so the, I, this is, I'll, I'll do this in detail, but the idea behind this is a very useful idea, geometrically, that you can apply to all those cases in which you have two competing quantities that have different homogeneities. For instance, when you have area and volume, or harmonic measure and volume, or harmonic measure and area and so on, okay? And let me give you a, a baby example of what I mean, okay? <coughs> so you can think on the integral of gradient u squared as being area. It's the linearization of area, right? If you have a minimal surface and it's very flat and you linearize, you get area. So I want to think as the integral of gradient u squared, I want to replace it by area. Right. And the integral of u squared, I want to replace it by volume. Okay. So if I do that, really I'm talking about, and I want to think of this result as saying that u cannot have spikes. In other words, u cannot be very, very, very tiny and shoot a spike, right? Because this result is saying, not the result, the one I wrote before, that u in L2, small in L2, implies u bounded, right? So in some sense it's saying no spikes, okay? So let me prove you with the same, although you can prove this in other ways much simpler, right? Let me prove to illustrate the De Georgi technique let me prove the following. Okay. Suppose I take the unit ball 
of Rn and I have a minimal surface. Okay. And suppose that I know that the volume at one side of the surface, so this is u, so if I have a minimal surface, then I have a competition between surface and volume, and I'll show you why in a minute, okay? Suppose, yeah, remember I said u was like volume. Suppose I know that the volume uh, on one side of the surface is very small. So S is the boundary of omega, right? Very tiny. Okay. Then I say that in the ball of radius one half, S has disappeared. Okay. So I say that this is a geometric sort of version of the, of the lemma of the Georgi, okay? Let me try to give you a, a sort of the idea of a proof, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this domain in a sequence of rings. I'm going to take smaller and smaller spheres but I'm not going to shrink all the way to the origin. I want to shrink to the ball of radius one half. Okay. So I'm going to take <coughs> the sequence of balls of radius one half plus two to the minus k. Okay. And I'm going to look at the volume of omega intersection VK. Okay. I'm going to show that the volume of omega intersection BK decays, or the area, I'll choose one when the proof goes along, or the area of the boundary, but I'm going to show that this area decays so fast that when you get to the ball of radius one half has disappeared. Okay. I'm really not going to take this, I'm going to take jk, but think on 2 to the minus k. They are going to be radii that decrease geometrically, okay? Okay. <coughs> Why do I say that they are here, if you have a minimal first surface, there is competition between volume and area? Okay, there is competition between volume and area on one side because volume is the integral of area, right? The volume is the integral, the radial integral of area. Okay. <coughs> so volume controls an area, a circle. I can, if I'm willing to divide by the width of the integration, right? So the volume, since we are outside the ball of radius one half, right? There is a factor which is negligible, right? And I can say that the volume, if I take any ring or any ring, the volume of the ring, let's say for any ring, B R minus B R 
the volume of the ring is the integral of the area of the trace right and therefore if i take the smallest the smallest trace if i take the smallest trace is less than the volume over the length of the of the interval so s rho minimum s rho min is smaller or equal than volume divided by r minus r okay this looks like the energy inequality if you think gradient u square is bounded by the integral of u square divided by the cutoff right what about the control of volume by area the control of volume by area comes from the minimality of the surface right because so i have here the area of s here i have the volume right then by this operometric inequality the volume is bounded by the area of the boundary the whole area of the of a s union boundary in a non homo different homogeneity than this n over n minus one okay but since this is a minimal surface i can always replace it by this one so instead of this i can put two times the area of the trace in the sphere. Okay. So I have that the area of the small, if I take any ring, now I have the ball of radius one, I have the ball of radius one half. I split it in these dyadic rings, right, of size 2 to the minus k, okay. If I take any ring, I can say, on one hand, that the minimal, so I have my, my domain omega, I can say on one side that the smallest area, the smallest trace, that is the, the narrowest neck of my surface, in any ring, let me call that SK, this minimum neck in the ring, SK, right, is bounded by this volume times 2 to the K, right, because 1 over R minus R is 2 to the K. Enormous factor, okay? But on the other way, on the other hand, this volume, right, from here on, the next volume, let's say, in fact, the whole volume from here on, right, is all bounded by this area of the neck to a power bigger than one. Let's say the previous one, right, to a power bigger than one. Okay. So I have a recurrence relation that has this power constant to the k, which is bad, but has this nonlinearity in it that builds up very fast. So I leave it as a small exercise that if you have a recurrence relation like this, and S1 is small enough, then the measure of SK, this is the, the area, right? The area of SK goes to zero when K goes to infinity. In other words, by the time you get to the ball of radius one half, the ball, you have completely squeezed the minimal surface into zero. Okay, so let me stop here and I'll redo this idea in the case of the Georgi theorem. But, but I insist, you know, I think this is a very powerful idea because 
Oh, in the many geometric problems, what you have is this competition between two quantities that can be area and harmonic measure, for instance. You know, if you are looking at free boundary problems or volume and harmonic measure, okay? And when they control each other and they have different homogeneities, this gives you sort of this uh, uh, uniform density theorem of the domain. Okay, let me stop here.